Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about the first five books that I've read in 2023. So if you watched my final December wrap up, you know that I'm going to attempt to do a different style of wrap up going forward. It's going to be a recent read series where I come on here and talk about every five books that I've read. Now of course the uploading schedule for this is not going to be as predictable as a normal monthly wrap up or a mid month and end of month wrap up just because I don't know when I'm going to be finishing all five books and then take that combined with the fact that I can only film on weekends. It could get a little bit wonky but the overall plan is for me to come on here and wrap up every five books that I read. And so without further ado let's talk about the first five books of 2023. So the very first book that I read for 2023 was The Last Housewife by Ashley Winstead. I chose this as the very first book to read in 2023 because I absolutely loved In My Dreams I Hold a Knife and The Last Housewife had been getting such hype from booktubers I absolutely trust and I wanted to go into 2023 strong and I figured that this book was the way to do it. I'm not going to say that I disliked this book but my reading experience wasn't as strong as I was expecting it to be. Now that could be for a few reasons. It could be because of course I was feeling the pressure at the start of the new year to start reading and to start completing some of the challenges. I was also feeling very pressured to love this book because again it is very hyped and it is by an author that is now beloved because of In My Dreams I Held a Knife. But it could also just be that I wasn't connecting emotionally with the story like I thought that I was going to and so because of that I have conflicted feelings over it. So The Last Housewife follows our main character Shay and at the very beginning of the story she is sitting down to listen to her favorite true crime podcast which is hosted by a child friend of hers named Jamie and in the recent episode of the podcast she actually finds out that her former college best friend Laurel is dead and they think that she committed suicide. However Jamie doesn't necessarily believe that to be the case and so he sends out a plea to Shay. He's like if you're listening please connect with me I think that there is something more to this and Shay also thinks that it's a little bit suspicious because it kind of mirrors the death of Clem which was Laurel and Shay's friend in college who actually killed herself in college and so she wants to go figure out what happened to Laurel. So she and Jamie end up connecting and they start investigating what happened and it leads them to some dark things. It leads them to what can't be described better than a sex cult and so Shay is trying to infiltrate the sex cult to see if she can find out what actually happened to Laurel and in her investigations she starts to realize this sex cult is being run by somebody that she had experience with in college and then it goes from there. So the premise of this actually sounds absolutely phenomenal. However, I just kind of feel like the execution was a little bit lacking in my opinion and also I had a little bit of a hard time relating just because of the messages of the cult. So the overall propaganda that this cult is spewing is old-fashioned values. It's basically a bunch of privileged older men, probably all white, who fundamentally believe that because in modern times we are so focused on equality and we are so focused on making women equal to men that we have forgotten their innate differences. And because of all of this, women are not allowed to be happy or satisfied or content in the traditional roles of women, which is what they are meant to do. So women are meant to be homemakers, they are meant to be wives, they are meant to be mothers, but because that's no longer really seen as acceptable in modern society, which is absolute BS by the way, but because modern day women don't see that as acceptable in modern society, they always feel that they need to be going out there and getting jobs and earning money, breaking the glass ceiling and things of that nature. They no longer feel happy and satisfied. They feel kind of lost and wandering. And the message of this cult is that you can come here and you can be who you are supposed to be. You can be dominated, you can be controlled. And then of course the women that gravitate to these cults, obviously obviously have some baggage that they themselves are dealing with to find the comfort that they're seeking in this very patriarchal, controlling, emotionally abusive cult because that's what it was. It was very emotionally abusive. These men would essentially degrade these women. It was horrific and I couldn't wrap my head around these smart, intelligent women falling for this cult nonsense. Now I know that this happens all of the time. Normal, average, everyday people who are otherwise very intelligent fall for this cult propaganda constantly. It does happen and if you think it can't happen to you, you're probably wrong. However, I was still stuck in this mindset of I would never fall for this. What is this BS? But then you also have to take into consideration the background of these women. These women all have things that they are trying to come to terms with from their past and this cult seems to be offering them a reprieve from what has been haunting them basically. But because I couldn't wrap my head around the messages that this cult was spewing, it was losing me a little bit because some of it got really out there, got really weird, got really abstract and I just found myself rolling my eyes at points. And so there was that disconnect for me because I couldn't actually connect with these experiences. 
was. But there were also some other technical issues that I had within the story. Something that was really small is that Shay actually starts the story married. She's living in Texas with her new husband. They've only been married a year. But once she sees all this stuff coming in about Laurel, she hightails it to New York, tells her husband absolutely nothing about what's happening. And then while she's in New York connecting with Jamie, she decides, you know what? I never wanted to be married to this guy. And so she breaks up with him. I don't understand why that was a part of the story. I don't know why Shay couldn't have just been a single woman the entirety of the time. It added absolutely nothing to the story whatsoever, except for the fact that Shay was able to use her husband's money to like fund the adventure that she was going on. So maybe that's why, but it was ultimately very useless. Additionally, of course, as Shay is connecting with Jamie, a little bit of romance kindles between them, which I also thought was completely unnecessary. The story did not need a romance whatsoever, and it was just ultimately distracting. And again, didn't add anything to the story whatsoever. Furthermore, I felt like there was a lot of repetition going on here. So Shay is basically going undercover. She's trying to infiltrate this cult. And so she's going to these events in this cult. And as soon as she starts to sense that she might be in danger or she might be getting herself into something a little bit risky, she ends up fleeing whatever event is happening. And this happens at least like four times. And I found that a little bit unbelievable because the whole premise of this cult is that you obey men. You are dominated and controlled by men because that as a woman is where you belong. And yet Shay was thwarting all of this. She was telling them no. She was saying she didn't want to. She was up and hightailing it out of these events. And yet she was still allowed to come back over and over and over again, which I didn't find realistic or believable. I feel like after some point, they would have put a stop to it. So all of those conveniences combined with the fact that I wasn't really relating or emotionally connected to the story made it so that I didn't love this one as much as I thought. And I have a lot of complicated feelings on it. I did end up reading it a four stars on Goodreads. I feel like my overall reading experience is more closely related to a 3.5. So it's been rounded up to a four. But again, I don't know if my reading experience was also clouded by the pressures that I was feeling at the start of the new year and the pressure to actually like the book. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with a four stars, but it's definitely not a strong four stars. And it definitely didn't hook me and grip me and connect me like I was thinking that it was going to. Also, The Last Housewife satisfied the TBR game prompt to read a highly anticipated book. The next book that I read is another highly anticipated and highly praised book. I read it because it was a book club selection. That is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Now, Gabrielle Zevin is an author that I wanted to try in 2023. And so when I saw that this was a book club selection, I knew that I was going to jump on the opportunity to read it because I did actually have this edition of it. And unfortunately, this is another one that I have really complicated feelings about. So essentially, this is a story about friendship. This follows our main characters, Sadie and Sam. They both run into each other after many years of not seeing or speaking to each other in messages Massachusetts public transit and they reconnect and Sadie actually hands Sam a game that she has programmed and that she has worked on because that is what Sadie does. She likes to create video games and Sam is really impressed by this video game and he wants to go ahead and make video games with Sadie and it goes from there as they create this game that ends up being a phenomenon. They create more and more and then they end up creating this wonderful game company and they become highly successful by the time they are 25 years old and of course this book follows that progression as they become successful and all of the trials and tribulations of their friendship. It also deals heavily with game making. There was a lot of nostalgia thrown in here as well because if you were like an 80s or 90s kid, a lot of the games that they mentioned in here are games that you yourselves would have played. And it also deals heavily with the game making component, which I actually found really interesting. I am in no way a gamer. Video games are not my thing, but even still that didn't deter me from the story. I actually found those components really interesting because they were not something that I knew anything about. And also as a character driven reader, I love that this was basically all character driven. This was highly focused on Sam and Sadie individually and then together within their friendship. And as this was my first experience with Gabrielle Zevin, I had never read her writing before and I felt that her writing was absolutely beautiful. I can't really describe why I found it was beautiful, but I would say that it was basically a step down from flowery writing or purple prose. It was like flowery writing or purple prose without the pretension, without the overly metaphorical speech within. So I absolutely loved her writing. I found it very accessible. It flowed very well. She had a wonderful way of describing things. And so for the first, I want to say like 50 or 60% of this, I was invested. I was in, I just wanted to keep following Sam and Sadie and see their journey because I was invested. Like I said, I'm a character driven reader and I thrive on complex character dynamics and the up and downs of a friendship definitely fits those categories. But then this book kind of takes a little bit of a turn. Now this is going to get a tiny bit spoilery. So if you don't want to risk being spoiled, please go ahead and wait until this review is over, which will be indicated by this book no longer being shown on the screen. So at some point in the story, Sadie seems to come to this realization about Sam's character. She has this epiphany. She thinks that she knows something. And so she thinks that Sam is just this selfish and self-serving man and that 
that he is going to do whatever he has to do to get the games he wants to be made, made regardless of who it hurts, regardless of who he has to run over in the future. And so she essentially kind of takes a step back from their friendship. She's still fully involved with the game creation, but she and Sam basically revert to colleagues over anything else. They have a very distant and strained friendship at that point, and Sam doesn't really understand why, because of course Sadie is not communicating any of this with him. And then a couple of years after this, Sadie actually starts a relationship with Marks, who is their mutual friend and producer, and they've kind of been all in this together from the start. Sam is not necessarily pleased by this, and then something tragic happens, and Sadie basically loses herself in her grief. She completely shuts down, she finds out that she is pregnant, she is now on her own, she's completely lost to her grief, she doesn't think that anybody else could possibly understand what she is going through, she completely forgets that other people experienced the same loss that she did, and so now she's entirely pulling away from her job with Sam. And then eventually, she ups and moves to Boston to be a teacher at MIT. And then she remains a teacher at MIT, and then it goes from there. She and Sam briefly reconnect at the end, and then it's the end. And that's where my complicated feelings are with regard to this one, because I was not expecting their friendship to be so strained for the vast majority of this story. And then when you're having Sadie go through all of this grief, and she's going and she's becoming a teacher, pacing of that is very different, because up until that point, it had been very intricately detailed on their relationship, and then all of a sudden, you're having years fly by with very little acknowledgement. Like suddenly four or five years have gone by and she and Sam have not seen each other in that much time and she's been a teacher and she's raising her child and that just felt very different to the rest of the story. And like I said, I didn't like how they were so disconnected for like a very good solid chunk of the story. That's not really what I signed up for when I started. And that also made me really dislike Sadie as a character because she was claiming that Sam was the selfish, self-serving individual and then she just became that person. She became that person that didn't care about anybody else but herself because she was so lost in her grief and her feelings. And then Sam was continuously trying to reach out. He did whatever he could to try to reconnect with her and rekindle their friendship and it just wasn't working. So that actually kind of made me resent Sadie as a character. I didn't like her by the end of this book and that's not really what I was expecting. Now of course with the ups and downs of friendship you do expect to dislike one at some point and then like him again and so on and so forth. But towards the end of this, this just felt to me like go Sam, boo Sadie. The direction that she took this book is not really one that I was expecting and it was not really one that I was connecting with. And as I mentioned, it really made me dislike Sadie and since she was the second main character in this story that basically made me hate 50% of the story with her in it. I did again give this four stars because I don't really believe that it could be anything less. I believe that this was so beautifully written and it definitely was poignant at times and it was a beautiful depiction of friendship and is it realistic? Possibly. But it just wasn't what I was expecting or wanting from the story overall. So I gave it a four stars but it's a very conflicted four stars. I wish that I ended up loving this as much as I did when it started but I just didn't. So it is what it is. Next I finished Capturing the Devil by Carrie Maniscalco. This is the fourth and final book in her Stalking Jack the Ripper series. I am so glad to have read it and to be done with this series. So if you're not familiar, this follows our main character, Audrey Rose, and this is set in basically Victorian London times. And of course, this is a time when women are expected to be prim and proper and get married and have the traditional roles of women. But Audrey Rose is definitely not like that. She is much more involved with murder and death. And she actually apprentices under her uncle, who is a medical examiner. And so she is constantly with him, like doing autopsies, cutting open bodies and things of that nature. And in the very first book, she meets Thomas Cresswell, who is also apprenticing with her uncle. And eventually they start investigating the Jack the Ripper murders. And like I said, this is the very fourth and final book in that series. In this series, you're following Audrey Rose and Thomas Cresswell as they are coming to America. And then they find more murders that could have possibly been linked to Jack the Ripper. And you find out how that is possible based on the ending of the first book. And it just kind of goes from there. I actually really enjoyed this more than I thought I would. I was instantly invested and captivated by the story. I was glad to be back with Audrey Rose and Thomas Cresswell, which I found really interesting because I remember almost absolutely nothing about the previous three books. I don't really remember any of the details. I don't really remember any of the character development or the crimes or anything of that nature. So I found it really interesting that being back with these characters felt very comfortable, especially the banter between Audrey Rose and Thomas Cresswell. This book actually features a lot more of their relationship because at the time of this, they are starting to become very serious and they are starting to court and become engaged. That actually takes up a rather large chunk of the story because they are about to get married and then some drama unfolds. Now I understand that it wasn't really necessary and that is a criticism I have is that this really didn't need to be there. They could have been focusing on the crimes and then in the end gotten married but then of course he wouldn't have had the like the drama thrown in but that that drama really wasn't necessary. It didn't need to be there but yet I was eating it up and I was hooked and it actually made me feel more connected to them as characters because it was very British soap opera-y and I was living for it but it definitely didn't need to be there and I understand why there's a complaint to that because there was a lot less focus I feel on the crimes and the murders that were taking place but still I felt that this was a very strong ending to the series. I felt it was very interesting the direction that they took and how she connected it to the first book in the series. It all kind of came full circle and you got a lot of the answers that you probably were seeking after the very first book. I ended up giving this 
a 3.5 stars. It didn't quite reach the four star mark because I don't necessarily think that this is going to stick with me. I don't think I'm going to remember a lot of the details in the coming weeks, but still I enjoyed my reading experience a lot more than I thought I would. And I'm very, very happy about that because I was nervous going in. I wasn't really in the mood to read it. I thought that I might have to DNF the series with one book left, but alas, I didn't. Definitely pleased with my reading experience on this one. The fourth book that I picked up satisfied the random color generator prompt for my TBR game, which was the color Vermilion, Killers of a Certain Age by Deanna Rayborn. So this follows four women. The main character perspective that you get is Billy, but it's also following Natalie, Mary Ellis, and Helen. And for the past 40 years, they have worked for an elite clandestine extra governmental organization called the Museum, who basically assassinates the worst of humanity. And they have been the killers who help take out some of these people. But now 40 years later, they're in their 60s and they are kind of being pushed towards retirement. And in order to celebrate their achievements, they are being sent on this wonderful cruise to celebrate their retirement. But as they are on the cruise, Billy notices somebody from the museum there on the ship undercover. And she knows that there's only one reason that they would be there. And that would be for a job. And since they weren't consulted about the job, they weren't connected with this person, they know pretty much instantly that they are actually the targets of this person who is there undercover. And soon it becomes a race for survival as they have to figure out why they are being targeted by their own organization, why there's a hit out on them, and how they can possibly be on the offensive to kill rather than be killed. So I would definitely say that this is a book for plot-based readers. This is very fun. It's fast paced. It'll keep the pages turning, but it's nothing of substance. So if you're a character driven reader like me, you're not going to get the strong character dynamics that you need to fully enjoy the story. Because like I said, it was very fast paced. It was very plot driven as you're following this four women as they are trying to survive. Additionally, because of the way that it's told, present day perspective is told entirely from Billy's first person perspective. And so you are not getting the perspective of the other three women, which also makes it impossible for you to connect to those women. And it also makes it very difficult for you to differentiate between the women. I was constantly getting them confused who was speaking, who had what background, who had what talents, things of that nature, just because you weren't getting their perspectives. So like I said, overall, this was a good fun time, but it wasn't anything else. It wasn't anything substantial. It's not anything that's going to stick with me. I'm probably not going to remember anything about this story in the next coming weeks. It definitely didn't necessarily live up to my expectations. I think I had higher expectations for this book than I needed to because it wasn't as substantial as I was hoping it would be. It was definitely a lot lighter. It definitely kind of glossed over a lot. It didn't really go as in depth into certain things like the plots that they were making to kill people. It didn't really go into too much detail about all of that stuff. So I just wanted a lot more from this than what I got. And so I gave this a three stars. And then the final book that I'm going to talk to you about today is definitely the strongest, Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. Now I am absolutely terrible at summarizing books that have even a hint of magical or fantastical properties to it. I don't know why, but I get so caught up in the details and trying to figure out what I should or should not say, but I will do my best to briefly describe what this is about. So this follows our main character, Galaxy Alex Stern, and she has basically been recruited to Lethe House. Lethe is considered the ninth house of Yale, and Lethe's job is to oversee the other eight houses of Yale, basically secret societies that all specialize in a different kind of arcane magic related to the occult. Lethe's job is to make sure that nobody is hurt or compromised when these houses are performing their rituals, because in the past it has happened, they've been very unregulated and innocent people have gotten hurt, and that is what Lethe is there for. Alex was recruited because it was discovered that she could actually see greys or ghosts. So she could see ghosts that were just roaming around and nobody else in Lethe could do that unless they took this specific kind of elixir. And her ability to see ghosts is very important because ghosts have the ability to severely disrupt the rituals of these houses, causing magic to kind of go awry. So this book is almost entirely told from Alex's perspective in the winter of when this book is set. However, you do know at the time that the story is set that something happened to Darlington, who was basically Alex's mentor and trainer. He was training Alex to basically take his position and then something happened to him. He basically disappeared. Nobody knows where he is or what happened to him, if he is dead or alive. You do get snippets of his perspective from the fall leading up to what happened to him. So you get a little bit of that context. But in the winter, Alex is basically having to take over Darlington's position much sooner than she would have had to otherwise. And she is trying to figure all that out while also trying to solve a murder of a girl near campus who died under suspicious circumstances. Alex thinks there's more to it than what everybody else is saying. And she is investigating it, even though she's being told not to. And it is what she uncovers in this murder investigation that really propels this plot forward. So you definitely have several things going on here. You have Darlington's disappearance and they're trying to figure out what happened. You have Alex trying to be Darlington in her position in Lethe House. You also have her trying to uncover what happened to the murdered girl, Tara, and how her murder actually connects to some of these secret societies at Yale. And she's desperately trying to figure this out. And I just really enjoyed this immensely. From page one, I was hooked. As you can see, I definitely tabbed in the first half of the story as I was getting a lot of context 
context and history about Yale, about these secret societies, about Lethe's role, about what it all means. I just love the entire atmosphere of this. You definitely have the dark academia vibes because this is set at Yale. It does involve secret societies and then of course it does involve a murder and so you also have the murder investigation aspect of this. I enjoyed following Alex as she uncovered what happened to Tara and how that all connects to Yale and some of the skeevy things that were happening and who was involved and why. I love the way that ghosts were used within this story as well and how they come to play a much bigger role in the outcome of this story than you might have originally been expecting and you also find out what happened to Alex in her past that led her to come on the radar of Lethe. So there were a lot of layers to the story I feel. There were a lot of things going on and I really and I was really fascinated by how Lee Bardigo was able to take each of these individual storylines and kind of wrap them up together. Because I was reading this physically and listening to it I did definitely get through it a lot slower than if I had just been listening to it so it took me about two weeks to read. Anytime a book takes a lot longer for me to read it definitely impacts the enjoyment level because it is more spread out and so the momentum kind of ebbs and flows but I still gave this one a 4.5. I just thought it was so well written. It was so atmospheric. It was so complicated in a lot of ways and I just liked watching all of the puzzle pieces come together. This was a very strong read for me and like I said I gave this a 4.5 stars. All right y'all those are the first five books that I've read in 2023. If you have read any of these please comment down below and let me know. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? I would love to know and please let me know some of the books that you started 2023 with and as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up. I post videos two times a week sometimes three if I have my shit together and have something to film and I would sure love to see you in one of those videos. Bye guys. Thank you.